For those of you who know my work, you will know that I propose that the earlier cities did not grow out of a farming experiment. They did not come from marketplaces that grew as we exchanged more agricultural produce, but were the result of an archetype that was shamanically accessed by a priestly elite using psychedelics. Now, when I'm talking about civilization, I'm talking about life as lived in cities. It's very precise, very specific. And that I'm saying these were the outcome of psychedelic experiences. So if I'm right, why are we so ignorant of the role that psychedelics have played in, in the creation and history of cities? What has happened to cut us off from our past? This presentation is going to focus on the cultural barriers that have prevented us from knowing more about civilized shamanism. In particular, I want to explore the historic role of the Indo-Europeans, our ancestors, especially from the Iron Age onwards, especially from about 1200 BC, although I am going to go much further back in time, because I think this has shaped our misunderstanding of the original city people who were in Mesopotamia. And I'm going to suggest that this legacy possibly informs modern Western negative attitudes towards psychedelia. First, I want to define my terms. What do I mean by civilization? And when we talk about civilization, this is usually where we start. With Greeks and Romans, we credit them with civilizing influences of sanitation, legal structures, medicine, philosophy, mathematics. But it doesn't take much genius to work out, however, that the Romans learnt much of what they knew from these people, pre-700, who were already on the River Tiber, around 700 BC, when the Latin speakers first rocked up, the Etruscans. They were already there. They were the ones who taught the Romans everything they knew about how to live in cities. They even built their early temples for them. But where do the Etruscans come from? Geneticist Steve Jones has identified genetic links with Phoenicians who had close links with Egyptians. And what is clear is that all of these people, Etruscans, Phoenicians, Egyptians, had much in common with, for example, cities of the Indus Valley. And while the Egyptian civilization goes back to at least 3100 BC, if not earlier, the much older cities of Sumer in southern Iraq, ancient Mesopotamia, date back even further to around 5,500 BC and a hole in the ground. Here's that hole in the ground. This measured about 12 foot by 15 foot, not much bigger than some people's house sitting rooms. This is the earliest layer of a temple at Eridu, which dates to about 5,500 BC. And what is remarkable is the evidence that all these ancient cities in spite of great distances of time and space, shared so many common principles that it is possible to suggest that they all originate from the same archetype with the following characteristics. And what this color wheel shows is it shows, starting with red, it shows domesticated farm animals, then it moves to government, which is orange, and then trade, yellow, cooked food, cuisine, not nuts and berries from the hedgerows, arable, ditches, irrigation, that kind of thing and then metaphysics moving into the priestly area, communication, education, and lastly, medicine. This is all very accurate, it's all very precise, it's about balance, design, infrastructure, organization. The earliest cities are surveyed and laid out in regular patterns. Sacred geometry, which you're going to hear much more about today from Tom Bree and from Louise later, was fundamental to architecture. These were people capable of extraordinary engineering feats involving massive blocks of stone weighing huge ton tonnage, brought over incredible distances, ignoring physical obstacles. Feats that we cannot replicate today. I mean, we are so advanced, and yet they could do these things. And they used the same level of precision, whether it was uh, constructing a sacred site, uh, a, a temple, as an aqueduct. And fresh water, for example, was essential to life in a city. The urban drainage in the Indus Valley has been described as unparalleled in pre-classical times. And after all, as we all know at a festival, how you use, deal with drainage and sewage is, is 
very important part about being civilized. The Egyptians called this archetype living in Mart, living in truth, the goddess Mart having the fe feather of truth. And I am going to say that this archetype did not happen as a result of the earth warming up and the end of the Ice Age. And I'm going to propose that it was shamanically accessed and that these cities were designed and built with a total concept of the city from the start. Having said that, there were momentous changes in agriculture which coincided at the same time as, as cities were built. Yeah. And it's called the Secondary Products Revolution. And what this meant was that instead of just penning up wild animals for meat and hides, which Neolithic man had been doing for thousands of years without actually domesticating them, an auroch, for example, became a cow and could be used for milking and producing the secondary products of butter and cheese. Uh, the onager, they thought, was the precursor of the donkey, but that actually stayed a, a don an onager. Whereas the tarpan, that did become modified and be turned into the wild, from the wild horse into a, um, a domesticated horse. The sheep is p possibly particularly interesting because that around this time horizon, which is around 5,500 BC, developed wool, having previously had coats like deer. And the Shanidar cave that you were talking about yesterday, Scott, has lots of sheep bones in it, but they were probably this earlier unmodified type of sheep. Whereas the significant part about this is suddenly they have wool and they become useful. And we have convinced ourselves that these changes in animals allowed the growth of cities. But this shift of domestication was relatively instant. It wasn't evolutionary. If it was really possible to domesticate wild animals simply by penning them up, why did that change not occur much earlier, when Neolithic man had been doing it for thousands of years? What brought about the change? Exactly. What brought about the change? I mean, it really begs the question, and it's a question that isn't posed. It's a question that isn't asked. Never about it. Exactly, because we take it for granted. We take it for granted that these things somehow happened. And so what they say is that because the animals changed, cities could happen. And I say it's the other way around. I say that these animals were deliberately modified. I say they were genetically in interfered with. Because what is the chance of Neolithic man suddenly spotting that a cat, an auroch has a useful gene? The, here is a picture in the top corner. You can't really see it. It's a cow that I, I used to own on, on the farm. How did Stone Age man suddenly have the benefit of hindsight? How did he know what would make a useful cow? And how suspicious that the outcome was so convenient and so useful. And it, it's also reasonable to suggest that there is a possibly a missing link between hunter-gatherers and Bronze Age city dwellers. The earliest Bronze Age farmers were not necessarily former hunter-gatherers who adapted to some kind of environmental change. They're completely different kind of people. There's a different kind of thinking about it. Hunter-gatherers are not used to staying in one place. They follow herds even when they pen them up for short periods. They were more used to killing than keeping stock alive. It's a totally different skill set, becoming a, a livestock farmer. And the earliest farmers did not switch from hunting herds to herding herds. And what supports this view is that the earliest examples of Bronze Age farming that I have been able to find always involved a settled pattern first, which included pigs before they changed to herding cattle and sheep. They modified pigs first. And pigs you don't herd over long distances, whereas cattle and sheep you do. So I find that in itself an extraordinary thing. One of the areas I looked at was in Central Asia, in the Fagana Valley, where they have massive transhumance, where they move these sheep and cattle up and down. And even there, the, the earliest Bronze Age that I found in the museum in Tashkent was to do with pigs. It wasn't to do with cattle and sheep. And the archaeological evidence reveals that the origin of the city wasn't the randomly organized marketplace. It doesn't grow organically. The first evidence is always a shrine, like that hole in the ground I showed you, this site at Eridu. Uh, it has um, the 17 previous layers of temple, and the earliest goes back to 5000 BC. And this is what the city you might, you can't really see that, but that's a kind of artistic representation of what it might have looked at. And the picture on the right has got a few soldiers wandering around because the, it's now in an Iraqi war zone. People like Jaquetta Hawks have commented that the key group of people involved in cities from the start are not the farmers, but the priests. 
So in order to shed more light on what may have been happening in Mesopotamia, I'm going to return to Egypt and propose that the Mesopotamian hole in the ground was created for shamanic journeying and that the Egyptian equivalent of the Mesopotamian priesthood, the pharaohs, were quite probably shaman. Because how else did they know what they knew? And how did they succeed in keeping Egyptian civilization so amazingly consistent for nearly 4,000 years? Is it because they shared something with these indigenous shamans, no different fundamentally to those found in the jungle or on the steppes? And the thing is, is that this whole study of shamanism is relegated to anthropology, ethnography. It's not considered to be something that, that cities and civilized and sophisticated people ever got involved with. But that I don't think is, is a correct view. Because after all, these people, they are initiated. They are taught to have out-of-body, near-death experiences so that they can journey in spirit on behalf of a person or a community to get answers. It's not just about being mystical and having a mystical experience. It's about how you deal with problem solving. And that's what I think pharaohs were trained to do. And during this initiatory process, spirit, spirits will dismember the shaman, strip the flesh from his bones, and then put him back together and revive him. He is therefore someone who dies and is resurrected, who learns how to travel in his other out-of-body way. And this astral plane is often fixed to, uh, is, is tied to a fixed point like a pole star. Or he can descend to the underworld, to the land of the dead, or rise to heaven, to the place of the gods. And this is done by climbing the world tree, cosmic pillar, or some other form of axis mundi using a sacred ladder, or stairways, or flight as a bird. This language is common to all shamanic experiences. And also common to them is the ability to fall into a trance and experience altered states of consciousness, often through the use of psychoactive substances or processes. So to return to the pharaoh, his destiny as top shaman was to be initiated into the Osirian rites for a once in a lifetime experience called the Hebsed Festival. This festival, they call it a jubilee sometimes because it happened every sort of 40 years. And during this festival, the pharaoh was buried alive, alive for three days in the realm of Sokar so that he could travel, so that he could astral plane and download the whole kind of archetype to keep civilization on track. Now, what confirms some of my view views on this is the, um, is the translations and interpretations of the pyramid texts because these describe his soul's journey while alive, a shamanic journey. It's only our kind of 19th century Christian view. That when we talk about the soul, we think someone is dead. But these texts, the Egyptians themselves called it the book of coming out by day, not a reference to death. There is one person who I've come across, Dr. Jeremy Nadler, who's an Oxford academic, who's published this work called Shamanic Wisdom in the Pyramid Text. And he's one of the few that has come to this conclusion where he points out how these texts are full of this kind of shamanic language found all over the world. And what the pharaoh was doing in the pyramid was engaging in alchemy. And I think we have completely misunderstood alchemy. We have failed to realize that this word alchemy probably originates from Egyptian word, the kemi. And the kemi, when it's translated, is the Egyptian name for the imperishable northern stars. And so what alchemy means is traveling to the fixed stars. This thing I told you earlier, the shamans, they look for a fixed point often. And that, in the Egyptian view, was the kemi, these imperishable northern stars. And that he may well have used narcotics, such as the blue lotus, which is known to have certain properties. And we even know about the Minoan poppy goddess. There's a little picture of her down on the far corner. So there's various substances that we know of that can produce kind of uh, psychoactive experiences. But it could also have been the solar bread in his, that he used as his means of going into trance. And this solar bread is likely to have been monatomic gold, what the alchemists refer to as the philosopher's stone. So have we confused a substance with a process? We think alchemy is about the making of a stone when that is only part of the whole out-of-body experience. This image of the pharaoh on the left here, um, he's got, he's got uh, possibly got the, a lotus on the top of, at the front of his head, 
and the solar bread in this cone on the top of his head. And the point at which the pharaoh consumed the solar bread was doing something called the hetep ritual meal. So was this the meal by which, the means by which the pharaoh brought on a trance? Is this when the blue lotus played its hallucinogenic part, or the solar bread? And in the pyramid text, it does talk about the, the solar bread. Here's another image of someone holding it in their hand, offering it. And um, Dr. Jeremy Nadler describes this pyramid text um, talking about the solar bread as an enigmatic, enigmatic food spell. And there's an utterance for the offering bled, bread to fly up. So to do this astral planning. So what was the solar bread? It clearly had pr special properties. And I have wondered if there's a link between the solar bread and the cow goddess Hathor. She had many roles, and mostly to do with nurturing. She sometimes lends her cow horns to the goddess Isis when he, she is tending the infant Horus. Hathor is also the one who nurtures the soul of the pharaoh on his journey. And she had other names like Nubta, Golden One. And if you go to her temple on the Nile at Dendra, and you find, you'll find there on the outside of the back wall, I've seen it myself, the hieroglyph for gold. It's, um, it's like a shallow bowl with a draped thing over it. That's the hieroglyph for gold. And in the crypt at, at Dendra, you find those strange light bulb reliefs. You probably can't. That's one in, in the middle, which may relate to certain electrical processes which could have been involved in purifying the gold. And even more significantly, at her temple at Sarabit el Kharim in the Sinai Peninsula, where in the 19th century, Flinders Petrie, the great Victorian archaeologist, he found vast quantities of a mysterious white powder with no animal residue in it. And this could have been solar bread, powdered, and it was hidden under slabs in the floor. It could have been the, solar, the philosopher's stone. Either way, Egypt was able to remain amazingly consistent, as I said, for about 4,000 years. With its pantheon of deities, we have the great god Osiris, the great and his consort Isis holding the balance, the pharaoh as the chief shaman, nurtured by Hathor, possibly using blue lotus, monatomic gold, solar bread to astral plane, keep it all going, watched over by Thoth, also here down on the left, also known as Hermes and Mercury, so that the Egyptians and the rest of the world could live in harmony, his mart on the far with her feather, live in peace and harmony. Egypt, Egypt saw itself as the temple of the world. It saw itself as having this role civilization, the full archetype. Yeah, you can put the feather up on your head and be marked. <laughs> That's right, exactly. So why did it all go wrong when we already knew what to do and the Egyptians were holding the balance and they were the temple of the world and it was all peaceful and these, these places um, knew how to survive and exist in great sophistication? Why does the civilized West have such a problem with narcotics and psychedelia? And why are we so ignorant about shamanism and its connection to civilization? And what have we done to our beautiful blue planet? What have we done? These are just dreadful images. I don't even want to dwell on them. How we treat people, how we treat the world and its solace, and is this really what it's all about? That's a load of television screens. I mean, is this where we're going? And so in my view, one answer, it's very simplistic, one word, Indo-Europeans. These, our ancestors, I think, have been and still are the problem. So how am I defining Indo-European in four ways? Language, culture, genetic material, and location. And by language, I mean these people who spoke these languages, which is Armenian, it's German, it's Greek, it's Roman, it's Celtic. Anybody who thinks the Celts were somehow indigenous to this country are deluding themselves. They are just part of these Indo-European Tokarians. But it doesn't include Basque, and it doesn't include Hungarian. And I'm fascinated, Scott, that you found so many of those skulls in Hungary. I thought that was really interesting. I want to talk to you some more about that. Uh, the link between these languages was discovered in the 19th century when they realized that Indian Sanskrit, Persian, Iranian, and Indian are also part of this list. When they realized that Sanskrit has the same, different alphabet, but it has the same roots as these other languages. So given this common root, it follows that these tribes must have once lived together. 
and much research has been done by Oxford academics and others into studying the close parallels between Celts and Hindus and the Sanskrit Vedas in terms of language, law, mythology, religion. And the, so the Hungarians and the Basques, they, they kind of confirm that there is this difference, that there is this commonality between these others. And they, they remain as islands that to help to show it's more than coincidence. I'll give you an example. The word for king can be reconstructed in an, in an Indo-European root word as reg. And that goes back over 5,000 years, this word. And it comes out as rex in Latin, Rix in Celtic, Raj in Indian, Reich in German. This is just to give you one instance. Uh, J.P. Mallory, um, an uh, Irish professor, is my main source <laughs> for this information. And, um, and from Reg, we get regulate. It's the basis for accurate measurement, rule of law. Um, but what, in particular, J.P. Mallory and others say, they've been very confused. They've said, well, how come... Uh, these, this civilized concept could have existed among very warlike people because I haven't really told you very much about the Indo-Europeans. And as I say, these links, they start more than 5,000 years ago because that's when these people last lived together. They split up around 3,100 BC. So long before they came to live in cities, they lived in fortified settlements with mud huts where the central focus was the hearth. Their society was essentially divided into a warrior caste system with a most, you see it later, you can extrapolate from later uh, on developments. You see it particularly in India with the, the Trivana, the three, three castes, with the Brahmin, the priests, the Kshatriya soldiers, and the Vaishya, the merchants. Warriors and warfare were a very significant part of Vedic society. And you see it with Romans and the Latin speaking tribes. Uh, these were, without exception, largely started off as a male sodality that arrives on the river Tiber around 700. They're not, they're not bringing many females with them. The story of the rape of the Sabine women was more than a myth. I mean, it was some sort of reality. It, the Indians and the Romans, they had in common their attitudes to women. They were not interested in any notions of social equality or they didn't understand karmic re reincarnation. And this linguistic analysis going back 5,000 years suggests the patriarchal nature of that society. The word wedding can be reconstructed to mean to lead the wife to the home of the husband. And whether that's by her hair or some other means, I wouldn't want to speculate. There's also very strong genetic evidence to show the connection between these people. Here is a modern day map of the distribution of the Indo-European haplogroup R1b today. And I also show in there the uh, family tree of this Y chromosome of most Western Westerners going back thousands of years. And what it shows is that up to 80% of Indo-Europeans today of males have this Y chromosome. But where these people come from isn't here. It isn't Europe, even though they're called Indo-Europeans. And they don't come from India. There are people who think Indo-Europeans originate in India, but there are really good, strong reasons for why that's wrong, why they actually came into India. Now, where they come from, where their homeland is, is north of the Black Sea in the Ukraine, in the Pontic Caspian. This is where, over 5,000 years ago, 100% of Indo-Europeans originate. So you can't see the map, so that's helpful. Um, and their time frame is being confirmed by genetics as being over 5,000 years because, they, as I said, they split up and mostly left the Ukraine. And if you want a graphic illustration of just how brutal were these ancient Indo-Europeans, what I need to explain is that this homeland is the home of the males, European males, of fathers, not mothers, fathers. It shows the dominant Y chromosome. It doesn't show where over 80% of female ancestors, European ancestors, come from. So if I superimpose the research of Professor Brian Sykes, an Oxford geneticist, on this map, what we can see are the unbroken lines of the matriarchal DNA. And what he, what he's written this um, iconic book with the Seven Daughters of Eve, and he's traced back the unbroken lines of mitochondrial DNA 
and he goes right back into the Ice Age. And you can't really see it because it's so dark, but he, um, I'm just going to leave the camera for a minute. These, he, he's actually identified the, the places where these women, these founder mothers, um, come from. And they're all in Europe, and they were living here during the ice. Now, the, when I say to illustrate the brutality of it, what I want to say is that we who speak Indo-European languages, which is all of us, we speak the language of the murderers. We speak the language of the dominant non-indigenous culture. We have been forced to accept their thinking. And if you think about that in terms of a brutality, mothers normally teach the children their own language. There's very little left of the original Indo-Ice Age language. Then, and we, so this, is, this, to me, is a really graphic illustration of just how this culture has come in and this whole different way of thinking has come in. And I don't think that Indo-Europeans have fundamentally changed their way of thinking since their time over 5,000 years ago on the Pontic Slip. In spite of something which happened very extraordinarily around 5,000, 4,000 BC in the Pontic Caspian. This extraordinary event, which I don't think anyone else has spotted, was I propose that contact was made between these proto-Indo-European tribes and the sophisticated, very advanced city people. Um, looking at um, the Black Sea, this area, so where the Indo-Europeans originate is here. Down at the down at the bottom is where the, um, those early cities I was telling you about originate. And I think that there was a movement from the city people in southern Iraq, in Mesopotamia, who traveled to the Ukraine. Now, you might say, why would they bother? Why would they go to a place where these people live in mud huts, they're warlike, they're warriors, uh, they're very unsophisticated. What on earth would we want to be doing with them? Very good reason. The sole reason why these people make contact is because of the wild horse. That is the zone of the wild horse. It goes all the way across the top of that, the steps. And the city people, potentially, if I'm correct, had the means of domesticating them. Now, you can read books about how the Indo-Europeans were incredibly amazing, and they domesticated all these horses and turned them into riding horses and, and all the rest of it. And I don't believe a word of it. I don't think the Indo-Europeans were capable of anything except for killing things and dominating. And I think that this... Because, after all, they'd lived with these wild horses for thousands of years and there was no change. But around 4000 BC, which is when the earliest horse bones have been discovered in the Sredni Stog region of Derevka, in that part of the Pontic Caspian, I think it's because of this contact. And I think this contact was more than casual. It was actually, believe it or not, genetic too. There's a Swiss firm of geneticists who established that Tutankhamun shares a common ancestor with the Indo-Europeans that places it right in that time frame and in that place, in that area. Um, and I think it's also rather interesting and curious that geneticists have traced the blue-eyed gene to the northwest area of the Black Sea. In 2008, Professor Hans Eiberg at the University of Copenhagen published research on the blue-eyed gene, tracing it to a single ancestor that lived between, he has a very wide time range, between six to 10,000 years. Well, I think it's more, probably more like 6,000 years. According to his research, a genetic mutation occurred which literally turned off the ability to produce brown eyes. And I just beg the question, is this mutation also linked to the city people? Now, regardless of all these genetic links, it's true that no cities appear in the Pontic Caspian. But instead, the Indo-Europeans picked up techniques and words that they did not necessarily fully understand, such as the meaning of that word um, king, reg. And there were a number of gifts from the civilizers. And linguistic in analysis, because etymology, linguistic analysis, doesn't lie. It reveals so much. It reveals what people knew and techniques they might have known and things like that. So they, they, uh, they, you can see that they knew these improved farming and stockkeeping techniques. And you find words such as plow, so, so, sickle. And they knew about stock breeding and cattle and sheep. So they obviously knew, including the horse, they obviously knew 
about secondary products because we find words to do with butter and cheese. So this confirms the domestication of farm animals. And as well as farming, they also increase their knowledge of metallurgy. Um, and what is fascinating about this is that they have words for bronze and copper, but they do not have a word for tin. And if you know anything about bronze, you'll know it's an amalgam of different metals. You'll know that they often use tin to help mix it with copper to, to make bronze, which suggests that the Indo-Europeans didn't necessarily know how to make it, but they were given it, they were gifted it. It's just an assumption that just seems logical to me, because often tin and copper are in completely different geographical locations. I mean, last night, Scott, you were talking about Cyprus being... The, that comes from that Latin root, cupris, to do with copper, that it's the copper island. And tin may well have come from Cornwall. I mean, people were moving around huge distances. And so you can't exactly just experiment, or oh, we'll just go mix a bit of tin and copper and experiment. And No, no when you're travelling massive distances, you're not going to do that. So I think it was gifted to the Indo-Europeans. And don't forget, this is before the Iron Age. You know, so they didn't know about iron. And iron is a simpler metal to use. It's simpler to heat it up and, and forge things and, and make iron. So even so, it wasn't long before the Indo-Europeans abused these gifts. They were quick to weaponize what they'd been given. The horse was turned into just another means of conducting warfare. This is a famous thing called the Parthian shot, in which arrows are fired from behind um, as they retreat. And when the Indo-Europeans did discover iron after 1200 BC, they recognised its usefulness in improving weaponry. Their operational philosophy was essentially militaristic expediency, in that whatever needed to be done, whatever goal needed to be achieved, would be done to achieve that goal, even if it meant decimating your own troops. I mean, obviously I'm talking baby long timelines here. I mean, this is to do with the Latin-speaking, the Romans, and decimation literally means to kill every tenth soldier in order to improve discipline. I mean, this is just graphic details I'm talking here. So at this point, I want to emphasize the differences between the Indo-Europeans and the city people who were living in cities in relative peace at the time the Indo-Europeans were in their mud huts. Their cities, the city people, they didn't have fortifications. If you look at the cities of Egypt or the Indus Valley or whatever, they're not fortresses. They're they're, they're perfectly uh, accessible to wh whoever. They're, they're not designed on a, on a military basis. So it doesn't suggest that they felt the need to fight. I mean, I know there's stuff to do with like the battles, the pharaohs and all the rest of it, and the descriptions that are carved onto various Egyptian temples. There are some views, Velikovsky is one of them, who think that these are much later uh, engravings and carvings, and they obviously may, may de depict the time at which the Egyptians actually became Greeks, the Ptolemies. And so I'll just park that for the moment. But either way, these things were not physically built as fortresses. And they acknowledged um, equality, uh, gender to some extent. Um, Egyptian and uh, goddess Isis and Osiris are accorded equal status. There's no sense that women are thought of as inferior. And curiously, the city people continued to favour bronze as their metal of choice, even after the discovery of iron, a potentially stronger and more useful metal, because weaponry wasn't their priority. And they had a way of thinking that was holistic. There's also views about metal that um, it's the bronze interacts with the earth in a different way. It doesn't interfere and break the natural electri electrical fields in, in the earth in the same way that iron does. Um, what Steve was talking about is, has some re relevance to this. So these peaceful city people interacted with the Earth in this more respectful way of working with the electromagnetic currents of the Earth. And they understood that how you do something is as important as why. The end does not always justify the means. Now, these contrasts in ways of thinking and living and being continued. And when the Indo-Europeans came to live in cities, thousands of years later other people's cities, they were the cuckoos in the nest, saying, thinking, for example, when the Romans took over the Etruscan sites around 700 BC, they took with them their original mindsets. When Latin speakers came upon the Etruscans, when the Greeks found the Minoans, they did not fundamentally change their militaristic way of thinking. So we should be very wary of calling this the start of civilization, 
more of a shadow of civilization. Because what the Greeks and Romans managed to get hold of were the externalities of this archetype. By 700 BC, agriculture involving domesticated animals and a systematic, highly organized arable production, that was widespread. The emphasis on caring for the individual body using uh, medicine and art of cooking, the link between food and medicine, that had been made. Medicine had become more sophisticated. Remedies were recorded, rep there were repertories that date back. The, the um, Eber papyrus dates about 1500 BC. These things were known. And if you look at some of the carvings of instruments, uh, medical instruments, uh, particularly in Egypt, then they were no different in Roman times, and some of them are very similar to what even continues to be used today. Uh, cooking was on a much larger scale. It involved bakeries and breweries. It didn't just rely on hedgerows. And there was the import of spices, development of cuisine with the importance of trade. All forms of communication, trade, travel, education. People knew how to navigate the Phoenicians. They were possibly their traders who worked on behalf of the Egyptian. They were legendary sailors. They're, they're reputed to have possibly even sailed all around Africa and possibly to America, who knows. But they certainly got about. They maybe even knew the world was round, but don't tell Dave Murphy. Um, geometry means earth measurement. But the bit that was missing was this next link between the priest-king relationship. This bit was missing in the Indo-European interpretation of, of civilization the bit that's to do with how to just shamanically access the secrets at the heart of civilization. Curiously, the Romans did pay lip service to that aspect based on the king-priest relationship. I was kind of blown away when I discovered that they had this priest who was called the Rex Sacrocum, the king of the sacred. I thought that was really odd. And it's like they just had these shadows of everything. He had no real power. He was as limited to duties concerning calendars. His lack of power and emasculated role serves to emphasize the superficial connection to this ancient archetype. And so disconnected from shamanic practices and the use of substances were the Romans that intoxication through alcohol was their main escape from reality. Not psychedelia. The bacchanalia is in a, this is, um, a freeze that's found in some tomb um, in the middle bit that dates to Roman times. And this served no other purpose than just pure hedonism. I mean, these scenes are quite, they're quite crude, they're quite graphic. Um, and there were, there were, it has to be said, exceptions in the Indo-European world, the Greeks, possibly because they were the closest to the Egyptians, and to some extent the Celts, where they took up the Druids. The Greeks had places like Delphi, because I do think that Druids predate Celts. I don't think they were necessarily just Celtic. The Greeks had places like Delphi where the oracle was, and they had Eleusis, where extraordinary mass shamanic rituals involving mind-altering substances took place. But these were private things. Not anyone could go. The Emperor Nero was denied access to the illusion mysteries. And, and although these places were important and their use lasted for a long time, they did not prevail. It was the might of Rome this map shows you the full extent of the Roman Empire at its height. And the Romans were more interested in using their military power to persecute what they regarded as carriers of ancient knowledge, those who may have used shamanic practices, including Druids. Uh, it's thought that one of the main reasons, alchemists, Druids, it's thought that one of the main reasons that the Romans chose to invade Britain, because they could have just kept it as a trading place, was to destroy the Druids at Mona on Anglesey, that that was their main focus for the military invasion of, of England, of, of Britain. And the Romans also persecuted the Essenes um, and the Chaldean Magi. I mean, the Chaldean Magi thing, that's extraordinary. In about AD 70, I think it was, um, Mark Antony fought a campaign all the way to the middle of Turkey where these Chaldean magi, the remnants, the, these ancient wise men, uh, continued to live in the remnants of the Hittite empire, and they went all that way to destroy them. I mean, why? I don't, I don't get it. I didn't understand that. And as the Romans increased in power, um, so Egypt declined. And there was a particularly sad prophecy from the Hermetica, ancient collection of Egyptian wisdom, talks about Egypt being the temple of the world, 
um, and that a time will come when Egypt will be abandoned. The land that was the seat of reverence will be widowed by the powers and left destitute of their presence. When foreigners occupy the land and territory, not only will reverence fall into neglect, but a prohibition will be enacted against reverence, fidelity and divine worship. And then this most holy land, seat of shrines and temples, will be filled completely with tombs and corpses. Only stories will survive and they will be incredible to your children. Only words cut in stone will survive to tell your faithful works. Whoever survives will be recognized as Egyptian only by his language. In his actions, he will seem a foreigner. Now, this reference to Egypt as temple of the world possibly refers to some idea that I heard, I don't know if any of you have come across Daniel Pinchbeck, who have read, written stuff about 2012 and things. He made an interesting comment at an event I was speaking at, that higher dimensional entities can no longer rely on humans to transmute gross energy to more subtle forms because there is insufficient reverence today. And if there's one theme that's come out of many of the talks that have been held this weekend is gratitude. We don't show enough gratitude. We don't appreciate, we don't acknowledge, we don't have this reverence. And so just even by talking about these things and revealing this prophecy, this is an opportunity for us to start to reverse the process. And some of the things that we do at festivals like this help to, to connect back to this ancient way of being, this eternal way of being. Now, the scenario that I described in this quote, it was gradual. From 700 BC onwards, Egypt became increasingly vulnerable to Egyptians, especially Indo-European tribes. This is the timeline of Egypt's decline starts in about 600 BC with the Persians. They're Indo-European. And then in 333 BC, Alexander the Great. He was unusual because he loved Egypt. He wanted to invade it in order to absorb it, and, and he wanted to um, protect its knowledge, and he helped to inspire the creation of the Great Library at Alexandria. But he's still an Indo-European at the end of the day. And it was... And, and this is when the Ptolemies, the Greek pharaohs, take over. And so we start to see a different kind of Egypt starts to emerge. It was 300, another 300 years before the Romans succeeded. They kept on trying, but they succeeded in 30 BC with Antony and um, connecting with Cleopatra, who, of course, was a Ptolemy. She wasn't really fully, purely Egyptian. And by this time, much of the secret knowledge had begun to disappear from Egypt, because Egypt had no real answer to military might. It's the same as the, um, uh, the Buddhists in Tibet. You have no real answer to the military might of the Chinese. You cannot cope with these, these physical uh, attacks on you. And um, then these persecutions by the Romans um, became even worse once the Rome discovered Christianity in the 4th century, and they decided to use that um, form of religion. So if we return to the Rex Sacrocrum, this um, priest, the king of the priest, he had always worked in a subordinate role with another priest known as the Pontifex Maximus, a title that is more familiar to us in a later context. It's this priest that morphs in the fourth century AD with Emperor Constantine's decision to adopt Christianity into the all-powerful Pope, the head of the Roman Catholic Church. And even today, he's still called pontiff. It means bridge. It's to do with the bridge of connecting things. And so what this means is that as the Roman Empire starts to decline around this time, the Catholic Church fills the gap. The Pope takes on all the trappings of, of the emperor. Uh, and, um, but in this, at this point, it's even more powerful because using Christianity, they had the means to invade people's minds and could carry on with their persecution, this time in the name of God. And it's now that the Romans, the, Chris, the Romano Christians, successfully destroy what is left of Egypt. With a massacre of the last priests in 394 AD, the Temple of Isis, on the island of Philae in the Upper Nile. The, and it's after this we no longer are able to access hieroglyphs. It's after this we no longer, Egypt becomes completely mysterious. 
And these same religious fanatics went on to destroy the site of the Illusion Mysteries in Greece, near Athens, in 396. And they burned down the famous library at Alexandria in 415 AD, all in the name of religion. Sounds familiar. And they brutally murder Hypatia, its last priestess. And at this point, we are symbolically, literally cut off from the ancient past. No means of accessing Egyptian wisdom is available. That is only rediscovered 1,500 years later in the 19th century with a Rosetta Stone when the Frenchman Champollion translates it. Because it's found this stone was discovered with three types of script on it, and one of them was a Greek script, which he was able to understand so that he could... He could see from that what the other words in the Egypt, two Egyptian scripts could, could mean. So to summarize, comparing the Indo-Europeans with the city people, people who began living in cities 7,000 years ago, largely peaceful, no fortifications, gender equality, favoring bronze for many reasons, a way of thinking that's holistic. They had alchemy with its use of mind-altering substances, secret practices, but nevertheless done for good of, of people as their means of connecting with the divine and for the benefit of their communities in shamanic rituals. They relied on secrecy to protect the knowledge of astral travel. Curiously, there were once upon a time some vestiges of European shamans. There were in northern Italy, um, up until the 17th century, people called the Benandanti, who would go out at night and astral travel to protect their communities on what's called the Ember Days. But these people were persecuted out of existence by the Catholic Inquisition. It's through the records kept by the Catholic Inquisition that we know about them. There were also some who rediscovered alchemy, who had, through esoteric knowledge and connections, the occult, and it's a whole other talk to explain how we reconnected with this Egyptian wisdom, but there were those who kept some of this knowledge alive and who secretly practiced alchemy. And the most famous of these was Sir Isaac Newton, who's called the father of science. It's a wonderful irony that I think he even made his discoveries of, to do with gravity to do with his, as a result of his alchemical astral planing. He was... Um, very active. When um, it was um, Maynard Keynes who um, acquired many of his books and much of Sir Isaac Newton's library, we're talking, he's born in 1642, so we're talking 17th century. And this is in the early 20th century, John Maynard Keynes had access to Newton's library. Vast majority of his books were to do with alchemy. But by the time Isaac Newton was born in 1642, Giordano Bruno had been burnt at the stake in 1600 for believing stuff that we take completely for granted. Galileo Galilei had died a condemned heretic, and the church had resumed its stranglehold on our intellectual development, all for knowing things we completely take for granted today. And given that alchemy was not part of the dominant Indo-European culture, what we were given instead was religion and the use of secrecy to have power and control over others, and only really allowed the use and abuse of alcohol as our main experience of altered states. So to conclude, apart from the fact that we no longer live in fortified settlements, unless you consider gated communities with CCTV cameras to be fortified settlements, <laughs> how have we changed over thousands of years? The warrior caste lives on in the military-industrial complex. Domestic violence is still the biggest killer of women in the West. Women are still treated as second-class citizens. They don't you know, equal pay, equal jobs. Steel has taken over as a more refined form of iron. Expediency is the prevailing culture of business as well as the military, and it is used to justify environmental destruction. And alcohol is still only the only acceptable and accessible drug. On this basis, is it really surprising that the dominant culture struggles with psychedelia? So we can either continue with our Iron Age disrespect or we can reconnect with this ancient archetype. They knew everything was interconnected, the, the Egyptians and others. Revealing the hidden history of cities shows that psychedelics and alchemy are our connection. We can reclaim this to a higher order of civilization than we currently experience. It has been done before and can be done again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
For those of you who know my work, you will know that I propose that the earlier cities did not grow out of a farming experiment. They did not come from marketplaces that grew as we exchanged more agricultural produce, but were the result of an archetype that was shamanically accessed by a priestly elite using psychedelics. Now, when I'm talking about civilization, I'm talking about life as lived in cities. It's very precise, very specific. And that I'm saying these were the outcome of psychedelic experiences. So if I'm right, why are we so ignorant of the role that psychedelics have played in, in the creation and history of cities? Back even further to around 5,500 BC, and a hole in the ground. Here's that hole in the ground. This measured about 12 foot by 15 foot, not much bigger than some people's house sitting rooms. This is the earliest layer of a temple at Eridu, which dates to about 5,500 BC. And what is remarkable is the evidence that all these ancient cities, in spite of great distances of time and space, shared so many common principles that it is possible to suggest that they all originate from the same archetype with the following characteristics. And what this color wheel shows is it shows, starting with red, it shows domesticated farm animals, then it moves to government, which is orange, and then trade, yellow, cooked food, cuisine, not nuts and berries from the hedgerows, arable, ditches, irrigation, that kind of thing. And then metaphysics, moving into the priestly area, communication, education, and lastly, medicine. This is all very accurate, it's all very precise, it's about balance, design, infrastructure, organisation. The earliest cities are surveyed and laid out in regular patterns. Sacred geometry, which you're going to hear much more about today from Tom Bree and from Louise later, was fundamental to architecture. These were people capable of extraordinary engineering feats involving massive blocks of stone weighing huge ton tonnage, brought over incredible distances, ignoring physical obstacles, feats that we cannot replicate today. I mean, we are so advanced, and yet they could do these things. And they use the same level of precision, whether it was uh, constructing a sacred site, uh, a, a temple, as an aqueduct. And fresh water, for example, was essential to life in a city. The urban drainage in the Indus valleys what has happened to cut us off from our past? This presentation is going to focus on the cultural barriers that have prevented us from knowing more about civilized shamanism. In particular, I want to explore the historic role of the Indo-Europeans, our ancestors, especially from the Iron Age onwards, especially from about 1200 BC, although I am going to go much further back in time because I think this has shaped our misunderstanding of the original city people who were in Mesopotamia. And I'm going to suggest that this legacy possibly informs modern Western negative attitudes towards psychedelia. First, I want to define my terms. What do I mean by civilization? And when we talk about civilization, this is usually where we start with Greeks and Romans. We credit them with civilizing influences of sanitation, legal structures, medicine, philosophy, mathematics. But it doesn't take much genius to work out, however, that the Romans learnt much of what they knew from these people, pre-700, who were already on the river Tiber, around 700 BC, when the Latin speakers first rocked up, the Etruscans. They were already there. 
They were the ones who taught the Romans everything they knew about how to live in cities. They even built their early temples for them. But where do the Etruscans come from? Geneticist Steve Jones has identified genetic links with Phoenicians, who had close links with Egyptians. And what is clear is that all of these people, Etruscans, Phoenicians, Egyptians, had much in common with, for example, cities of the Indus Valley. And while the Egyptian civilization goes back to at least 3100 BC, if not earlier, the much older cities of Sumer in southern Iraq, ancient Mesopotamia, date back.